our lesson tonight, <coughs> uh, the text is going to come from Proverbs 18, 22, if you want to look at that, or you could just look on your paper under point one. I wrote it out. <coughs> and um, and then we're our example passage that we're going to use is, is back to Jacob. It'll come out of uh, Genesis 29 later when we get into, ver into uh, point three. We'll we'll take it from Jacob from there. But here's what uh, Proverbs eighteen twenty two says: He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. In the Greek, that would be our 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 word. I gave you the Hebrew word, but the equivalent in Greek would be karos or grace. So let's look at that again. It says, He who finds a good wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. When do you think look, no, wait. When do you think he obtains favor from the Lord? According to that verse. Not looking for your opinion. I'm looking <laughs> for God's opinion. So, <clears throat> when does he obtain favor from the Lord? When he, when he finds, right? When he finds, when he finds a wife, he finds a good thing. So, so when he finds his wife, he, he gets two things. He finds a good thing. When he finds a wife, he finds a good thing. Why would that be so? Why would that be so? That he fi that he finds a good thing. Why would that be so? See, he gets a something from by finding a, a wife, and then the Lord rewards him for finding that that wife. Are you with me? Yes. You see that? All right. <clears throat> so what did I ask you? Why was it a good thing? <laughs> You know where this all began? Where did this whole marriage thing begin? In the Garden of Eden. And why did it begin? Wait, now wait, I don't want everybody to talk one time, Glenda. Well, he was alone. And what did and, and what did God say to himself about man being in the garden? It wasn't good. For men to live alone too long because they get wacky. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> so, no, women get wacky when they get married. <laughs> men, men get wacky when they're single. <clears throat> no, you know, Seth? Thank you. Thank you, Sam. But he's watching. Huh? I know. This little verse here is a pretty powerful verse. He who finds a good thing, it's a good thing that he found a wife because it's not good for a man to be alone. That's God's opinion about it, isn't it? And so the second thing was, I'm going to, I'm going to make, listen, here's what it says. This is out of that Genesis 2 passage in verse 18. I don't know, or earlier than that, but he says, I'm going to make I am going to make him, what? Now we're a, a helpmate or what would be another way to say that? Or a helper suitable. When the English, is, when the English came back, they, they, they carried it a little bit further, right? A little bit further with that. Uh, and so when a man finds a wife, According to the plan of God, and was it a woman or a wife? A wife, right? Now, I don't mean that. Amen, Suzanne. 
I probably got points here and didn't know it off the web tonight here. <clears throat> but listen, it's not that fact that a man finds a woman. It's that he finds a wife. That's, that's one woman that he's willing to go monogamous with the rest of his life. Right? <clears throat> and God designed it that way. Man didn't understand it. He's struggling, so God explains to him why being alone is a bad thing, which he, which he could relate to. <clears throat> and it's not just any woman, but a wife. I, I, will make, I will make for you a suitable mate, a suitable helper in your life. That's, and let me tell you, if you're fortunate to be a single man and find a wife and you know that that's what's going to uh, be achieved by it, then you have something that's called companionship, and it's a good thing. It's Wait a minute. It's a good thing. Didn't he say that? Mm -hmm. He finds a wife, finds a good thing, <clears throat> and what God does to top it off, you know, put the ice cream on the cake, is what? Give, gives him grace. And, and you and I both know you need every bit of that that God can give you uh, for your marriage, right? Need every bit of it. So don't, don't, don't shortchange yourself on the grace of God in your marriage. All right? So it's a wonderful little passage, one little verse in there, but it's a pretty powerful little verse. So let's open with a word of prayer, and we're going to talk about marriage is a marriage made in heaven. You've heard that expression probably. Yeah. Sure. Let's pray. I gave him a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin. This is the church age under the new covenant. Every believer is a priest and every priest is responsible for his spiritual status, condition. You can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a book written for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And so God has provided for us through the crucifixion of Christ, the death on the cross, to have that cleansing work extended to our life when we get in the flesh and commit personal sin, we confess that. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. There's our word and cleanse us and restore us to fellowship in the ministry of the Holy Spirit who indwells us because we live in the church age. What a marvelous thing this is. And not only is this going to be important for you to study the Word of God, but to have the Word of God exercised out of your life into real life time. That's called the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So our Father, tonight we come to you and we're so thankful for the freedom we have to assemble. We know, Father, that there are many in the world that don't have the luxury and the freedom that we have, and that's a grace thing that we have. And yet uh, they put their life at great risk to study the word of God. Uh, people who are hungry for the truth of the word of God walk miles and stay days and put themselves under some of the most rugged conditions just to sit in a church like this on any given night. And we're thankful, Father, for these that have come and the support that we give to missionaries out there. Uh, and we send helpers to them. I mean, really good helpers. We lift Rick before you today, Father, and pray as he prepares himself for another journey out there, uh, a Titus operation, a Timothy operation, to be a, a great support team member for these missionaries out there. Uh, and then to come back and give us reports of what is, what's going on on the mission field that we might prepare others to send. We're so thankful for that. For our ladies' conference this coming weekend, Father, we lift them before you and uh, bring, bring who have hungry hearts. Uh, bring us the people, bring us women who have their hearts filled with ministry. Bring us women who are, are, are not afraid to commit deeply into the Lord in ministry. Give us women, Father, who are willing to have their lives changed radically for Christ in the plan of God. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> if you was to do a survey of people, which I did last week, you would find some very interesting 
uh, answers to, have you ever heard the expression, a marriage made in heaven? And how, how would you view that? I mean, what does that mean to you? The uh, variety of questions are pretty amazing. And I gathered from that that there's two answers to this. There are more than two, but they fall in two categories. One is secular. They have a secular opinion about it. A lot of people had a lot of opinions about it. It fell under a secular idea. And then there's a scriptural idea of a heaven, of a uh, marriage made in heaven. So what I discovered in just asking a few people that uh, crossed my path during the week, um, the secular view, view generally, a general secular view would be that a marriage made in heaven, it was interesting that it, 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 wasn't, didn't, it wasn't necessarily used by people for marriage, but rather a concept. And I found him to use it in, in workplaces, in, in uh, career areas. Uh, and for them, it, it was being able to have some kind of happy coexistence of compatibility in a, in a workspace. And they call that a marriage made in heaven. Uh, and uh, other situations like that, uh, they seemed there seem to be uh, red, rental opinions um, in a secular atmosphere, which I found, I found kind of interesting. And, I can, and after I began to hear these a few times, I remember hearing that when I was a young man growing up in Michigan. I, heard this, I never heard the scripture review, but I did hear the secular view. And that's, this, is, this phrase has been around a long, long time. But what I'm interested for us is the, what is the scriptural view of that? And so what we're going to talk about tonight is six aspects of the scriptural view of a marriage made in heaven. We're going to look at it as literal, <laughs> okay? We're going to look at it as literal. The first thing I want to talk about is the scriptural view of a marriage made in heaven would begin with two believers in the Lord, or, or the, the, scripturally, or else we don't even talk about it. <laughs> A, a marriage made in heaven, as far as the divine program, is that two believers are marry in the Lord. Um, in First Corinthians, the seventh chapter, for, verse thirty-nine, uh, Paul is writing on a subject matter, and he says, "A wife." He's talking about di divorce and death and remarriage and all that. He said, "A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband uh, is dead." Uh, she is free to marry to whom she wishes, and then I put it in, in large print, but only in the Lord. In other words, a believer should not marry an unbeliever, okay? Now, it could be that you married, didn't know any better, and you wound up uh, married to an unbeliever, and so you better hit your knees <laughs> because, uh, and listen, I tell you, hitting your knees works. I can tell you that. But um, the same idea is also by Paul gives this. Paul also talks about it in the ninth chapter, verse 5, that I put on your paper. But the key is only in the Lord. As far as a marriage made in heaven has to begin with two believers in the Lord. And then, I, of course, I quote, I quote again Proverbs 18, 22 to you. I don't need to go back to that. So I'm trying to make very, very clear to the Christian church what a mar marriage is made in heaven is. It's two believers in the Lord. In other words, they both believe that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day as the source unto their salvation so that when we believe that, we are saved by grace through faith and not of herself. It is a gift of God. I learned very early in my pastorate that I should do marital counseling uh, because people had so many screwy ideas, even people in the church. And so I, I required um, early in my ministry three months of counseling. Uh, they consist of six sessions over a three-month period because people have busy schedules. Uh, there were six lessons that or interviews that I had to have with them. And at any point, we, w we could both back out of our commitment. So we tried to get ahead of the marriage thing well enough so that if I said, I can't marry you to they could go and find somebody else to marry them, right? 
So I tried to have my three months out far enough, usually three months out, out aside of a couple months before they got married. And I have backed out of many, many of, not many, but a few. And I've also, going through six sessions, have had people go like, whoa, we are not right, and close it down. And that, that saves sending back gifts and, and crying for you and your mother crying for years. So, and I can tell you today it's worse than when I began because I don't know how many years ago I shut down doing weddings. A pretty good while. Uh, I, I know I had shut it down probably about the time Al came back, or I might have shut it down earlier than that, Al. I don't remember. But anyhow, um, because because this just the foolishness, uh, just absolute foolishness. I mean, p- people, they would get irate with me and tell me who was I, and I said, well, I'm the preacher. I don't know. What, who am I? I'm going to stand by the word of God. I'm not going to marry. Listen, you can get a just a fee. They're probably any preachers. And, and I've had people up their ante on me, you know, like, well, we, you know, what's a pastor normally get? And I go, I don't charge anything, so I don't even know what you're talking about. And so they go, well, you know, it's it's worth the $250 or something to me to have you do it. Or they give me some number like, oh, yeah, that would convince me. Yeah, I, I, I would go against God for $250, sure. <laughs> How crazy is that? <clears throat> And a lot of times I got it from parents. I didn't get it from the couple. What's it going to, you know, I'd have a mother say, what's it going to take for me to, what's it going to take for us to get this done? I know what he's saying. It's a God. But anyhow, point number two, soul love and compatibility is another issue. Soul love. Now, I'm not talking, I didn't say love. I said soul love. S-O-U-L. <clears throat> and compelling is another issue. Now, I want you to turn your eyes on this thing over because what's interesting is a guy who never got married is the guy who talks all about marriage, and that's Paul. <clears throat> now, there are some people that think Paul got married, but when I met him, he wasn't. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. <laughs> but I know when I met him, he was a strong believer, and uh, he wasn't married. But in 2 Corinthians... Paul lays down something for your marriage, and this is an outline for you to follow on compatibility. If you want to know how to to be compatible with the divine plan of God in your marriage, because God created marriage. Would you agree with that? Man didn't create it. God created it. Stay with his program. He's going to tell you in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and this is a very famous verse, 14 through 16, he's going to tell you, um, five ways, five, five ingredients. There, here are five things that you've got to have that God says that I made marriage to be a good thing. If you found a good wife, if you found a wife, you found a good thing and you will obtain grace. Now, here's how you're going to obtain grace. He gives you uh, five aspects that you should be working on in your marriage. Now, here's how he does it. <clears throat> And uh, this extends to uh, partnerships in a lot of different areas. This could apply to business partnerships and other things uh, that would be necessary. But I'm after marriage. Here's what he says in verse 14. Do not be bound together with an unbeliever. All right. That's a person that does believe in the the gospel as we identified it. (laughs) Do not be bound together with an unbeliever. Now watch this. For what partnership what partnership has righteousness and law to, and lawlessness? They're contrast, aren't they? When we go through, you're going to see contrast. But see, the key word, now listen to me, the key word in this is what? Partnership. That's the key word. And and what, what where should it lie with two believers? R- righteous living, right? Righteousness. The key word, partnership based on, listen, it's not just partnership. It's partnership based on righteousness because you battle lawlessness, rebellion. The second one, for what fellowship, what fellowship 
has light with darkness. Again, we got conflict here, haven't we? How, how do you resolve conflict? See, again, we have a secondary conflict. How do you resolve conflict? Light. Light always overcomes darkness. That light is the light of Christ. It's the light of the Holy Spirit. It's the light of the Word of God. It's following, it's following the light of Christ in your marriage. And, and listen, you want fellowship? Everybody wants fellowship. All, everybody wants in that close sharingness, that, that intimacy. Everybody wants that. That, that word fellowship is the idea of inter, inter, interconnecting in a special way. And he said, well, here's how you do it. You do it in Christ. And let me tell you what you're going to fight. You're going to fight darkness. And, and, that's, and what's that darkness going to do is separate you from achieving what? Fellowship. You understand that? Yeah. That, that alternative, that, that conflict area is a true conflict area. Now, here's third one. Or what harmony has Christ with Biel or the devil? All right. So what harmony? See, the key word is harmony. And that, that word in the Greek is where you get the word uh, symphony. S symphony. It's easy for you. The, uh, symphony, right? And it's, it's Sam, if, if everybody comes in, you say, well, we're going to play such and such a tune. And everybody goes like, I got it, Sam. And they play, a, they play off key. They play into it something else. I mean, everybody can't pick out your own song and play it. And then say, well, we're just, here's the song we're going to do. And then everybody plays a different song. Uh, they'd want their money back after about two of those kind of songs. And, and so that, that's the word for harmony. Uh, harmony. And the key, the key to harmony, the key to it is Christ. And the enemy of it, the enemy, and listen, boy, listen, the, I thought, listen, the, I, the, you, you counsel more people in this area, they're in conflict. They're, they're in conflict. Uh, they're out of harmony. Uh, and you can tell it. She comes in, and he comes in, yeah, and she won't do this, and he won't do that, and she won't do this. And I'm like, wait, can, you, can we get on the same page here for just a moment? Because I can't keep up with both of you. You're playing two different tunes here. And you, you came in to, to, to play one tune, and both of you playing a tune I don't even, I, you know. You understand what I mean? It, it's all, a, and I, if you do any counseling, people, people call you up. They, they cry on your shoulder. That's what they're crying about most of the time. Um, um, and then we have the word, and then we have the word common, commonality. Uh, and, and he says, what has a believer in common, a believer in common, the, the commonality of two believers together? You say, what, what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? The, the commonality ought to be between two believers who have applied the first three things. You understand? Know who are working on those three areas. The, listen, these are the five areas that people get divorced over. And then, uh, and then he says, and what agreement, in verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And then he goes on to say, for we are the temple of the living God. And then he goes on to give a verse. I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And he goes on to talk more about it. Agreement. And, and listen, where your agreement it is in the word of God. Your agreement is in the Lord. Your agreement, your agreement is in the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells you. Do you see that? not in some kind of goofiness outside of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You, you're not going to get along. Listen, the only way you can be compatible, both of you getting in the flesh, and there are very few places you can be in the flesh and be compatible. They were the things probably that attracted you in carnality, the person you're marrying, and that's the only places you got in common. In the flesh. And I know a lot of people stay married they stay married, and they stay married, and they have to stay in the flesh in order to be compatible. And they're not incompatible in all the areas they need to be in the marriage, and nobody knows it worse than them. 
here are five areas that are really important in your marriage. God designed your marriage for the, with these five things in mind. And if, you want to, and if you want to obtain favor, you better start working on them. And every one of them have an alternative, right? And a, a war for an area of conflict. <clears throat> and, and it's angelic. It's the angelic conflict. If you go back and you look at all that, you're going to see what it is. <laughs> it's important you work on these areas. And um, we'll do more on this subject. I'm just introducing it. We'll do more on it, okay? And so we find partnership, fellowship, harmony, commonality, and agreement. And listen, the key word is in the Lord. Every bit of this for this to work because they are all, listen, did you, when we identified these, did every one of them have an area of conflict? Yes, right? Every one of them had an area of conflict. <laughs> And, and pe a lot of times people, and, and they're trying to fix all kinds of stuff, and there it is. Work on this, work on this, work on this, work on this, work on this. You say, well, I'm willing to work, but my maid isn't. Okay, do your part. Do your part, right? Hold your end of the bargain up with the Lord. Right? Wait on them to come along. If they don't, then Lord knows how to deal with it, right? Who's the marriage belong to? The Lord. He purchased you, two believers. He purchased both of you into the marriage. The marriage belongs to the Lord. And you can obtain what? Grace. You can obtain grace. And if you, you will obtain grace, but you got to know these areas of conflict, how, they, how they're resolved. And where the conflict really is behind it. Well, he does this and she does that. And that. Listen, what is the area? It's going to be in one of five areas. Figure out the area and you'll know what the conflict's about. It's not about what you're arguing about. Well, I like Orioles and she never gives me Orioles. <laughs> so I slept in my own bedroom last night. Is it too much to ask for? I go out, I make the hard living, I bring in the, I bring in, and it seems like she does the shopping, it seems like I could get Orioles once in a while. So I'm through with it. Let's say, what would that fall under? Well, it's, we're going to have to talk a little bit because I don't know that God had the Orioles in mind on this deal, but let's talk about it a little bit to figure out it's going to be in one of five areas. It's going to be in one of five areas. That's helped me with counseling. Also, the key, to the, the key to Christian marital compatibility, listen to me. GOA. In five areas you really got to pay attention to. GOA. Anybody know what that stands for? Grace Operating Assets. What will God, get? If, you, if you get married, what will he give to you if you marry in the Lord? He'll give you? He'll heap grace on you. He'll heap grace on you. <clears throat> okay, how's he going to do that? Well, he has grace operating assets. And you need to be aware of them. These are the tools that God has equipped you with. By his grace, he has, he has equipped you in order to achieve success, right, in every one of these areas. There's no conflict that he can't resolve. And he's told you that. He's told you, here are the five areas, here's the key to them, and here's the conflict to them, right? Yay. Make me work tonight, that's all right. And so let me just mention, and, and I, I just want to mention six. Let me just mention six. There are more. I just want to mention, mention six that are biggies. Here's how God has equipped you. Here are the tools. You know, you go to this counselor, you go to that counselor, and you're hoping he gives you some tools to dig, dig out of the mess you're in. Well, here they are. All right. First of all, get into a, now look, the key word I put it in bold print is consistent exercise of the grace operating asset. Consistent. And for me, consistent exercise means daily. 
Doesn't mean weekly, don't mean monthly, don't mean quarterly. It means daily. Give us this day our daily bread. It's about daily. And so when I say consistent exercise of the grace operating assets, and I'm, I'm going to describe six of them. These are the biggies. These are the biggies. These are the tools you've got to have to dig yourself out of whatever it is. Here's one. Spiritual growth, inhale and exhale of the word of God. Inhale, exhale. Some days it's large inhale. Some days it's large exhale. But it's the constant flow, right? All scripture is God breathed, is profitable. And th that's a key, a key to spiritual growth is, listen, it don't matter. Listen, at today, it's not how much you're going to learn. It's how much you have learned that can, you can use. Are you with me? That everybody goes, well, when I, when I get spiritually mature, when I get, uh, uh, then I'm going to do that. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to do it now because whatever you got, you're going to need. You understand? At some point, you're going to run out of gas, so take the gas can. So, so you, you, that's a key. That's a that's cons consistent and daily. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. I mean, your wonderful prayer life is based on it. Pray without ceasing. How are you going to do that when you have to pray according to the will of God to hit to hit, to hit the target? So that's number one. It, it's not necessary. These are not in order. It's just I put them down that way. The second one that I have listed is walking by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's at Galatians 5, 16, 17. Most wars can be resolved as soon as one person is in the flesh, the other person must get in the spirit. Adios amigos. You got to get in the spirit immediately because then you're going to have a fight between the flesh and the flesh and nobody wins. Somebody has to do that. And the first one to do it is the most important one in that area. We're not going to go there. And um, flesh can't fight flesh and anybody win. The only way you can win is be in the spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God. So never fight in the flesh. Walk, walk. And you know that word walk in Galatians 5.16? It's a present active imperative second person plural. Very pateo. And it means in every encounter, in every situation, well, I'll tell you, no, no, no. Don't give me no excuses why you could get in the flesh. Well, if, you, if you'd have, if he'd have done that to you, you would have. I might have, but I shouldn't have. Right? Yeah, I'm not saying I, I but I shouldn't have. So you've got to be quick on the trigger when somebody, because when, and how do you know when you should? You get defensive. You can feel it in you. You, you, you feel defensive immediately. <laughs> and you know what you're doing? Hey, inner dialogue, you talk to yourself. Hey, inner dialogue. You need I mean, go get out of that deal. Don't stay in there. You're gonna you're gonna fight in the flesh. Get out of there. Well, you don't understand. I don't have to understand. Get out of the flesh and get in the spirit. Don't go in it. Don't go there. And so that's really important. Remember that word walk is an imperative. And it's a present imperative, which means it's 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 a standing command. Now, and, and that's the secret of 1 John 1, 9. You know, sometimes you can get in the flesh so quick and nothing's really, it's still, I mean, you're there, you're hotter in the, you know, you're hotter into the collar business right then, and you know it, right then you need the 1 John 1, 9. Because they're not going to go good after that. Let's get it resolved. And if you're the man in the family, you say, we need to have a word of prayer right now. And she, and she may say yes, and she may say, may say no, and, she's, and then if she says not, right, not no or not right now, then when? I'm going to give you an hour and let's come back. We need to have prayer over this. The guy's got to take a lead on that. Takes lead on everything else. I'm the man. <laughs> well, let's be the man then. Nothing wrong with being the man. But sometimes you have to take ownership of it. And, and so that's important. Listen, I'm talking about a guy that's there. Uh, then the third is walking by the faith cycle. That's important, that faith cycle. You know, the word of God has to be, be brought around. And, and listen, the toughest part of the faith cycle in my life was always on the weight side. I'm not a guy who waits good. 
I'm good on waiting as I study the word and, and learn the word and, and believe the word. But when it comes to the application side, I'm like, hey, 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 hey. Got things to do, places to go, Lord. Come on now. I was on your schedule over here. It seemed like you could get on mine over here. And they go like, no, I'm still on my own, Bubba. And so I I struggle with that in my own life. I'm, you know, uh, a personality or something. I don't know what they call it. They have some goofy term for it. But uh, I said A would be right for me because I'm an A to my. So what other one would I have? But anyhow, but so this one, this one, I I really struggle with this one. I struggle in a lot of ways, and I struggle with it in in the deep south. I really struggle with it because everybody, let's let's table tell tomorrow, and it drives me. But listen, I've learned to, I've learned it, that's a good thing for a guy like me. We'll do it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And I go like, yeah, but it seems like tomorrow never comes. Do you know how long tomorrow is? 24 hours. That's like, that's like a week. Uh, putting off, putting off the old man, cosmos diabolical thinking, put on the new man. It's very important out of Ephesians 4. It's very important. It's, it's a key. <clears throat> At some point, <clears throat> you got to say, I have this sin. I have this sin problem that means it's habitual at different points in your life. I can't get rid of it. You know why? Because you haven't dealt with the source. You say, well, the source of sin is, is old sin nature. Mm, yeah, that's one half of it. But the other half is what you've been doing with your mind. Don't set your mind on the flesh, Paul says. Don't set your mind on the flesh. Then Paul says, make no provisions for your flesh in regard to its lust. How it's, and you remember that word forethought? Uh, that word uh, make no provisions was the word forethought. And that's what we're talking about when we do that. There's, there's a source behind this. There's a source in the lust of the flesh, and there's a source that operates the mind. You have to conquer them both or you'll never conquer them. Got to conquer them both. The Holy Spirit takes care of one. The word of God it exercised out takes care of the other. And what you have to do is you have to surrender the flesh to the Holy Spirit. And you have to surrender your mind to a way that is not healthy for you and switch it over to the one that God says I want you to do. <clears throat> then that source, when you dry up that source, then the source of the ministry of the Holy Spirit operates a lot better because this one keeps getting in conflict with this one over here. That's what we're talking about in that. And Paul goes into that in, in the book of Ephesians and the book of Colossians. And then the book of Romans, if you studied it, you would see Paul in chapter 6, uh, 7, and 8, he deals with it. Then he comes back in chapter 13, deals with it again. He deals with it in another way. He deals it with the idea of forethought. <laughs> You know, I mean, people are always saying, where, where do you get this stuff? And I, uh, well, right out of the word of God is where I get this stuff. And how, how do I know it works? Because I apply it to my own life. I don't study this stuff to give it to you and not to me. I'm going to tell you that. I need it worse than you do. This, uh, then the other area is, a, I think, important is a spiritually gifted ministry in and out of the church body. I think that is so important for a couple. As they grow in their in the ministry of the Holy Spirit and they grow in the ministry of the Word of God in their life to become a team in ministry. Now they're gifted, aren't they? Go to the same church, become part of the same body of Christ, get engaged, and become part of ministry. And you know it's an amazing thing how that works. It doesn't mean that I pick out yours. God picks it out. He has gifted you at salvation. That's one thing. And the other is that. You know, what, what the key is to be supportive of the other person's ministry. That's the key, to be encouragement in the other person's ministry and um, uh, in prayer and attendance and other ways that you can support and do what you can. Um, I'm so appreciative of my wife. My wife just has an excellent ministry. From the day I met her and, and walked down the aisle to give my life to Jesus Christ and then went into ministry, my wife, is the most supportive person you could ever imagine. And 
uh, when I'm in the pulpit, I know my wife is, quote, on her knees. And she always sat, always sat in a position in the church where I could make eye contact with her. And, and uh, I knew I had it made. I knew that when I hit that pulpit, I knew that I was going to hit what I had to hit because my wife was going, was going to be sure that my attention span, everything that was going on, and I could always tell when I was getting a little way out, out, out of balance because my wife, I mean, she put her head down, and, buddy, she was in deep prayer, get him back, Father, get him back in there. Get, and, you know, I'd go home. I said, boy, you prayed a lot during the service. She said, boy, you, you required a lot of prayer today, buddy. <laughs> And uh, and that was very helpful to me. That was very helpful to me because I would get I would get, well you know me I get kind of wound up and out there sometimes. My wife would just pray me back in. And after a while, I began to learn some things from it. You know, God began to teach me. You know, you don't need to run out there and do those things like I am now. <laughs> She'd be going like, get back, get back. And so spiritual gift in ministry, and it's not like you have to be on this, on the, in the same ministry, but you have to be as supportive of each other's ministries going on because we're gifted different. And, and the key is being supportive. Be, listen, here's the word, in harmony, in agreement <clears throat> type of thing. And then finally, uh, ev- being evangelical, uh, being aware of people's spiritual needs as a team, as both a, uh, husband and wife, uh, locally, nationally, and world. Um, that's, you know, a, a wonderful thing. I'll go home and I'll, I'll say to Jane, see if she's got this prayer list, this, geez. And, um, and I, I will say, I got another name to add and she's got columns, you know, uh, okay, what, what's, what are we doing with this? And I'll put it over there and, and boy, she never forgets it. And she'll, She'll bring that list out every once in a while and say, well, what about so-and-so? <laughs> and I go, hmm, I need to get back on that, don't I? Hmm, what about so-and-so? She, be, she holds me accountable when I put stuff down there. Uh, what about so-and-so? And I go, hmm. And so that's a wonderful thing. Um, and I I probably, bec- and you've heard it, and I'm not going to go back through it, but in my conversion, that 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 prayer was very important. I felt was a key to my conversion. That church in prayer over my need for Christ was enormous, and it impacted my soul enormously. The power of prayer to get people saved and get them right with the Lord was enormous, and and the the number of people that get on the same page in any given church for that. I was a hard nut to crack, and they got me. And uh, anyhow. And so I, I, I really feel that, and I've seen it with my wife over the years in my ministry, uh, how uh, valuable that is. And both her life and her ministry that she has out, very evangelical. We're both very, you know, the, you know, it's very important to us that people know how to, how to go to heaven and all that business. So that's important. Here's the third thing uh, that we're going to talk about now. I want to now get into Jacob's uh, life. And and his and his preparation for marriage and marriage, the the problem is, is that he went into a family that were what we would probably call nominal nominal believers, Laban, they were believers. They out of the Shemites, they all went to that family to get people. Uh, they didn't want to they, they didn't want to marry local girls who were heathens, so they would go back and and they would get them from there. And I mean heathen in a, a, a scriptural sense, yeah. Uh, and so they would go back and, 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 and do this. But what Laban had and that family had forgotten were some of the basic doctrines. That's why we're, we pound basic doctrines around here. I mean, we pound them like crazy because they're, they're the glue that holds everything together, so to speak, the basic, what we call basic doctrines. And um, unfortunately... Laban, as a believer, was nominal and, 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 and had, had, had moved away from some real basic doctrines, especially on marriage. The very simple things I've talked about today out of Proverbs 18.22, gone. 
go on. Now, the concept should have been there because of the book of Genesis. I mean, th this, and th that was hot off the press, right? When Laban and, and Jacob are there, this is a book that's hot off the press. Agreed with that? Right. I mean, they weren't looking at Genesis from our standpoint, Revelation and back. They were, they were, they were in the midst of a, a fresh new uh, idea and concept and everything else as far as Scripture and the canonization of Scriptures. And, and so it, it, it kind of, but it, if, you're in a, if you're in a ministry long enough, you see how people once knew some things and now have become what, nominal believers. I mean, they're all over the place in what they really believe. And so this is the family in which Jacob has gone and selected a, 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 a wife. Uh, Laban, it's very important to know uh, that Laban, uh, Jacob has gone off course, but Laban sure has as a leader within the family structure of a patriarch system. And so here's my point, point three. Uh, it begins with my, my I, I'm going to give you an example of what I've been talking about. Jacob entered a seven-year dowry contract agreement with Laban for Rachel. Now, we know that story. That's a very famous story, at least around here. And, and Rachel was the younger daughter, and that's important to this story. This story begins in Genesis 29, 18 through 20, when this dowry contract is agreed upon between the two parties. That is the father of the bride and uh, Jacob. They enter a dowry contract, right? Seven years for, for her. Uh, that seven-year contract uh, in that business that they were in shows that they were a wealthy family. Uh, that, that's a... The, the seven-year contract is a long contract, uh, and and uh, and it required that. This is a wealthy family that he was going to take a bride from was a wealthy family. Now, he came from one himself, but he hasn't one now. He's the prodigal son out there. I mean, he's not, right? His dad had it, and as long as he stayed, you know, but he had to leave, right, hurriedly. And, but, but both sides of the family are wealthy. You know, the Nahor side and uh, the A Abrahamic side. They're both wealthy families by the time that this becomes. So Jacob, verses 20, 21 of Ch Genesis 29. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And, and I love this. You know, I love God's, God has a wonderful sense of humor in reality. And it says, and they seemed to him but a few days because he was in love. Ain't that the truth? Uh, and, and what happens if you're not in love? Well, they get those days get really long. <laughs> no, I don't know. What do I know? I just know that when when you're in love, uh, it, it life flies by pretty quick. When you're when you're in love, when you're out of love, they just drag on forever. Uh, because of the his love for her, then Jacob said to Laban. Uh, that is on the day the contract was over. On the day the contract was over, Laban says, give me my wife for my time is completed that I may go in with her. Right? I mean, I'm ready to get, I'm ready to seal this deal. You know, seven years, it flew by, but I, I uh, yeah. Now Laban is in contractual, Laban is in a contractual pickle a contractual pickle because of the Mesopotamian married custom of the firstborn daughter must be married first. And of course, that's, that's Leah, not Rachel. And he's in a pickle. You see, verse four tells us what the pickle was. If I say pickle, you know what I mean, don't you? Okay. Uh, he, he's in a bind, uh, whatever. Laban's seven-year gamble, he took a seven-year gamble with his kid, knowing that he could, during that seven years, he could marry off Leah. That, that was a no-brainer for him. And so he gambles with Leah over that seven years, getting married. He enters that contract knowing that he can get rid of Leah in seven years because she's the all Mesopotamian girl. She was probably a cheerleader. She's in a wealthy family. Only a fool wouldn't marry Leah. 
Oh, you fool. Ah, this will be a piece of cake. I'll get seven years. I'll get Leah married. Then I'll get my second daughter uh, married. I mean, how sweet a deal. This dumb kid. What a sweet deal. I'm so glad he was still green behind the ears. Because I can, I, can, I can wrap this whole deal up in one nice little deal. That seven years over, I've, I, all the kids are gone. Just mom and me. <laughs> I don't think we don't think that way. It was possible. It was possible that he could not. I mean, how, how was it possible that he could not find, in seven years, could not find one suitable mate for Leah? There was no way when he entered that contract that he didn't believe. Because he had guys, you know, when she was in high school, the little cheerleader, that little skirt, that thing. And, that, and he had to say, no, get out of here. You know, don't be coming around here. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you how I was. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. So he couldn't believe he had this little Miss All all Mesopotamian girl, <laughs> you know, like all American girl. And he couldn't get rid of her in seven years. But you know, he couldn't. Who could believe that he couldn't get rid of that girl in seven years? She wasn't ugly. She could have she could have been on the Dallas cheerleader squad. He couldn't get rid of her. What is going on? No matter how high he tried, how hard he tried, nothing worked, listen to me, except Jacob. Oh, yeah. But he's got him working like crazy and Googling over his youngest daughter. Laban had forgotten that marriage was a divine institution created by God for mankind. He had forgotten it. He, he, he put it on the back burner, and the back burner didn't work. Genesis 2, 18 through 25, verse 18, the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helper suitable for him. This is one reason your marriage was made in heaven. I said yours. I mean mine. That's how you know if you're married, you've got a believer. This is how you know your marriage is made in heaven. Because God makes them. <laughs> and he sets a guide rule for you. This is how you know it. Are you married? Yeah. Is she a believer? Is he a believer? Yes. Well, guess what? You've got a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> I had a guy in a marriage conference one time. I made that statement, and after the conference, where it was stayed the weekend, and when the conference was over, he said, well, I can tell you one, it may have been made in heaven, but it's lived in hell. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, that marriage conference didn't go well for him and her. <sighs> so everybody has a come back to you, but they are made in heaven, and they should be, they should be lived that way on earth. Uh, but this is one of the reasons your marriage was made in heaven. It's because God designed it, and you're part of that program. Now you have to pay attention to the program in order for the grace to work in your life to bring it to the place that brings you great joy and happiness. This is why Proverbs 18.22 is important in the selection and in your marriage. What God says in Proverbs 18.22 is very, very important to your, your marriage. Because it reminds you that your marriage was made in heaven, right? When God said it, I mean, I didn't make this up. I didn't sit down. I wouldn't be smart enough to come up with a proverb like that. Here's point number five. So Laban hatched. He's, he's in a pickle, right? So Laban hatched a new secret scheme to fix his problem. Now, if he'd have went to God, God had took care of it right away, right? But, well, I made the mess, I'll clean it up. Yeah, you made the mess, let God clean it up. 
How about that? Think he'd do that in a heartbeat? Did he send his Christ, did he send Christ to die on the cross to fix your mess? That's the biggest mess you'll ever have in your life. So Laban has the new secret scheme to fix this problem. Well, Jacob's all I have. <laughs> and it still doesn't dawn. That's all you need. The, this is the marriage God has selected. Still not there. So he thinks, well, maybe I can kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, he went in with this idea, right? Look, I'll get him seven years later. In the seven years, I'll marry off Leah, and he's going to work seven years for me, cost me nothing, room and board, the rest of it's out, and then I, all my money I keep for myself. At the end of seven years, I'll get Rachel. He'll go home, <laughs> got one out. In the meantime, I get seven years, I get whole. Listen, I'm the master deal maker. I know I can do this in seven, seven years. I could do it in seven minutes. Well, name that tune. <laughs> Remember that? Well, then name that tune. However, the problem is, however, he ignored that they were real people with real feelings in real time with real futures. That's why he needed God. That's why you need God. That's why I need God. Once again, Laban shoots blindfolded, hoping to hit the bullseye. Would you hate to go hunting with him, Don? He'd go out there and he said, well, I'm going to put you in a blind. And then he puts a blind on him. Puts a blindfold on him. And you go like, well, give me your gun. Because you're not sitting up there blindfolded shooting with me down there, stirring up, with down here, st uh, clicking the horns. Whatever you call them. Antlers. Rat rattle the rat, rat rattle them. Yeah. Once again, Laban shoots blindfolded, like so many Christians, like so many believers. He shoots blindfolded, hoping to hit the bullseye. This time, he substituted Leah for Rachel on Jacob's wedding night. <laughs> Boy, this guy is desperate. It never dawned to Jacob until the next morning of the honeymoon. In verse 25 of chapter 29, so it came about in the morning. Remember, I did a study on this recently. Behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, watch this. Watch the three questions. Don't you know he was probably a little heated in this discussion, huh? Don't you know his voice was raised up pretty good? <laughs> I know mine would have been. Oh, man. He says, he says, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? And so he tells him. He tells him, well, we have a custom in Mesopotamia, a <laughs> uh, marriage custom. Since you've asked, uh, you can't marry, you all, the, firstborn, the firstborn daughter has to be married first. Probably the silence was as much as it is here. Point six. The tragedy of this arranged marriage is that Laban looked out only for his own feelings. Let me tell you, that never works well. You know, it's my way or the highway. That ain't ever going to work. I tell you, that's not of God either. Not in relationships. He threw everyone else under his authority. Listen, he threw everyone under his authority under the bus. Right? Threw him under the bus. Looking out for Laban. Not looking out, not looking out for Rachel, not looking out for Leah, not looking out for Jacob. Looking out for Laban. Number one, I'm number one. I'll always be number one. Don't you forget it. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. So on her special once-in-a-lifetime honeymoon night, 
she, she becomes part of the deception of her father and her family. She knows, doesn't she? And she has to play that part. Uh, she didn't have to, did she? But I don't know what her options would have been. I don't know the culture that well, but she could have come, she could have said, "Look, everybody's deceived you. We're not going to sleep together tonight. I had I have no control. I had no control over it then, but I have control over it now." We're not going to sleep together until we get this resolved. That could have been a good idea, wouldn't it? We have been both brought into a terrible plot of deception, and it's wrong. And this is the first time I've had the opportunity to be able to sit under a different authority and make my stand. Agreed? She's under new authority. And under this new authority, we need to make a stand. That had been pretty good. That had been tough, though, wouldn't it? And she didn't do it. That would have been good. And I, I, th I think to myself, how will she and Jacob deal with being married in the morning? Well, it didn't come out well when he looked over and went, whoa! And think how, how that honeymoon night must have been when he thought he had Rachel. Imagine what kind of words are being passed into her ear. But he thinks he's got Rachel. I don't know. I'm just thinking. Maybe she prayed in her heart. Maybe she prayed that Jacob would come to understand God's immutable, perfect timing. And accept this marriage as the will and plan of God. Maybe even she prayed that God would help Jacob see her as the gift of God's grace. Talked about in Proverbs 18.22 and the second chapter of Genesis, verse 18. Maybe she did that. Unfortunately, Leah's feelings will not be considered by anyone in this story. This is tragic. Until she has her fourth child. They swept it under the rug. He goes back, works seven more years. He gets Rachel, goes back seven years more, and... The uh, only thing Leah is good for is children. He gives her nothing else. Nothing else. All of his love goes to Rachel, the second wife, and not to the Fanon, goes to the first. Nobody, nobody, and listen, remember that song? Nobody cares for Jesus. Nobody cares for me like Jesus. Remember that song? Nobody cares for me like Jesus. That's what she's going to come to. She goes through. She goes, first child, like so many marriages, let's try to, I'll try to hold my marriage together by, with a child. What a, what a burden to put on a child. That don't, and it never works, right? That doesn't work. She goes through the first child, the second, and she names him by her struggle and her emotional pain. Remember that? We talked about that. Her fourth child, she had a change of heart. You know what she did? She took off the old man and put on the new man. She went, enough's enough. I don't need to be doing it. Everybody, the only person that can change in this marriage is me, and I'm going to change. And I, here's how I'm going to change. I'm going to change for God. I'm not going to change for my husband. I'm not going to change for my father. I'm not going to change for anybody else. I'm going to change for God. That's putting off the old man and putting on the new man. When you come, I am getting rid of this, and I'm putting on God. I'm putting on God. And when you start to put on God, some good things is going to happen in your life. And so her fourth child, she has had, she's now had four kids, and her fourth child, in her fourth pregnancy, in her fourth pregnancy, during that nine-month period, she got right with God. She began to take off the old man and put on the new man. By that, I mean she is sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like the prodigal son of Luke 15, 17, she came to her senses and looked. Nobody cares for me like Jesus in her heart. Nobody. Everybody has made me die for them. Nobody's been willing to risk them, their life for me. 
except Jesus. Now, that would have been Christ in her day. But I stayed with the song I was interested in. Nobody cares for me like Jesus. Nobody. And listen, you've got to come to understand that in yours. Nobody, there's nobody will ever care for you like Jesus. And listen to me, that's enough. It's enough to heal you. Jesus Christ is enough to heal you, and healing you is enough to put your marriage back on track. And Leah did it. That's exactly what Leah did. She turned her life over to Christ in this way. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's old man Cosmos Diabolicus. You've Listen, you didn't have to play the game, but you did. She played it through four children. She played that game. When the fourth child came in her nine months of pregnancy, she said, enough's enough. I'm sick of being sick. I'm tired of being tired. I'm, I'm tired of being thrown under the bus. Nobody... Nobody cares. For me. Listen, it wasn't that nobody cares. She'd gone through three. Now she's into her fourth child. Nobody cares for me. Nobody cares for me. Maybe I'll have one more and this will work. None of it did because it only works through Christ. And she finally come to realize that nobody cares for me like Christ. And that's enough. And so she turns it over. I mean, she, she's sick and tired. And she's not going to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And what it, listen, here it is. It's Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest for your soul. And you'll be able to put my, my stuff on you. The world has put you on you, and you're not able to bear. What I put you will be a light load compared to what you've been carrying. And listen, I will help you carry it. That's a phenomenal promise to you. And she got that. She got that. And that's part of the journey of taking off and putting on. But it all starts with the cross of Jesus Christ. It all begins with, this is the guy who really loves me, and, will, and there's your life change. And it was for her. Listen, now, listen. she calls her, her, uh, her uh, child. She, co- she conceives again, this is the fourth child, and says, this time I will praise the Lord. When that baby was born, she had she was a new person in Christ. It, this was the, listen what she says here. If every if the first child old man thinking, second child old man thinking, third child old man thinking, fourth child new man thinking. She calls him, she calls him Judah, which means I will praise the Lord. I don't care what I'm going through. Listen, I'm gonna praise the Lord. I'm gonna stop being sick and tired of being sick and tired. She came to her senses like the prodigal son returned to God to find the inner peace, contentment, and true happiness in God alone. See, God alone. And so I close with Paul in Philippians 4, 6 and 7. He says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That's exactly what she did. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And that's exactly what she got. And that's true for you. If you think that that, that's not true for you, you're wrong. That's a promise given out of the heart of God for you. Okay? Let's have prayer. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and internet we pray father this message it doesn't matter where you live in the world i'm in america but you could be anywhere in the world in this message you for because god is the same his word is the same the same bearing is upon you what what he said in mesopotamia was true in palestine it's true in america god is the same yesterday today and forever and the message is relevant to your life tonight If you're tired of being sick and tired and because the world has beaten you up and it overloaded you and you're depressed, come unto Jesus. Come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest to your soul. What a wonderful offer that is for you tonight to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. 
That's the offer he offers you. You tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired? Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, depressed, down in the dumps, hit rock bottom, broken. Don't know anything about tomorrow except today is terrible. I mean, Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. And not only to those of you who need to be saved, but those who are saved that need to return to God like Leah. Return to God. God alone will rescue you. God alone has never left you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nobody loves you like Jesus Christ. No one loves you like I love you in Christ. Come home. Come home, dear prodigal one. Come home. If you're in the Birmingham area, come home. Come home. You've been out there wandering long enough. It's time to get it's time time to come home. Come home. Come home. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm. 